Mark Shifley. Can't keep your head down on a two-on-one, man. Come on. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Here's the center penalty coming up. Look at the Woohoo! Buckle up, baby, when Mark Shifley is playing hockey. And welcome to the Worst Sports Channel on YouTube, Hawk Garbage Sports with me, Coach Ryan D. Shifley ends it for the Jets. The Jets win a 4-3. Hellebuck has a baby. Eric Comrie starts and the Jets play their best game of the year, minus three or four minutes here and there. So one thing that's funny about hockey teams, not just the Winnipeg Jets, is that when your backup goalie tends to play, teams tend to play a little bit better. They elevate themselves. They play with a little more panic and not even just a little more urgency and panic in their game. They play with more defensive structure. We've talked about this on this channel time and time again. The Jets do not play team defense in all three zones very well. And I truly think it's because they got a guy like Connor Hellebuck in net. Hellebuck makes up for a lot of mistakes because Hellebuck's that good. And the Jets think they can cheat. The Habs do this all the time too in front of Carey Price. They cheat and they cheat and they push for goals because in the end, you got one of the best goalies in the NHL behind you. But that doesn't lead to Stanley Cup winning habits. What leads to Stanley Cup winning habits is playing like the Jets played tonight in front of Eric Comrie. If they can play in front of Connor Hellebuck the way they played in front of Eric Comrie defensively, they're going to win a boatload of hockey games. And they scored three goals doing it that way too. So it's not like they're goal total is going to go down a huge amount playing defensive first hockey. These are habits and behaviors the Jets need to do. They collapsed in front of Eric Comrie when they were required to. They played structurally perfectly in the neutral zone, in the offensive zone when they didn't have the puck, and they played excellent defensive zone. And you could see it because the shots were limited to well under 30. The Jets need to limit these shots under 30. If a team doesn't get more than 30 shots, especially against Connor Hellebuck playing his 55 to 65 games this year, the Jets are going to win a boatload of hockey games, even against teams like Colorado. So this was the clinic that the Jets needed to put on defensively. Playing without the puck is so much more important than playing with the puck. And if you're new to Hot Garbage Sports here, consider giving us a subscribe, giving us a thumbs up. Help us play a little defense here on this channel too as well. Help us play a little offense by growing. We would love to have you here, Jets fans. So back to good team play. You can almost imagine Paul Maurice in the locker room talking to his team members, talking to his players and saying, guys, we got to stay out of the penalty box today. We don't want to be shorthanded. And he's got to say it politically because he can't say it's because Eric Comrie's in net. No way. But that's the message you got to get through to your players, the bumping Comrie's confidence that we got to stay out of the box. And the Jets did that for two and a half periods. You know, they talked about keeping the sticking penalties and the aggressive penalties down. You wonder why they don't end up fighting or running guys after they run into Comrie. It's not because they don't like Eric Comrie like, as much as they like Connor Hellebuck. It's because they don't want to go shorthanded. They need the win. The Jets also played defensively. Just pure sound in front of it. It is defense first. And the Jets almost play a perfect game until the end. When the end comes, Paul Stasny has had a massive problem this season controlling his stick. I, You just, you can't take these calls. He's a veteran guy. He knows you can't do it. You won't get away with it in the new NHL. He gets called for more just sticking penalties on the hands that are just silly and it puts the Jets down and it costs the Jets Almost. I mean, it pushes them into a shootout. I don't think if Stasny doesn't take that penalty that, well, we end up in the position we end up in. So, I mean, that's just my opinion. The Jets played a near flawless game up to that point. You just don't want to go shorthanded when you're playing with your backup goalie after you played such a good game. And my buddy Winnie Sunny over on Discord, join our Discord down below if you want to chat with me or any one of our great hot garbage sports fans, friends, an analyst. Winnie Sunny points out, hey, two goal lead, worst goal in hockey. And Winnie is fantastic. He's a smart kid, but it's a hilarious old wives tale in hockey. There's no such thing as a bad lead. And the only thing better than a one goal lead is a two goal lead. And the only thing better than a two goal lead is a three goal lead. So you want the lead. The sentiment comes though, from the act of if you have two goals, you feel very comfortable and you're going to start getting sloppy. And actually that's what happened to the Jets today. They got a two goal lead. They got a little bit sloppy at the end and it almost cost them, but they're able to rally back, which is the sign of a good team. All in all, 
I'm going to give the Jets an A-plus effort. This was a fantastic game. We're going to talk about the power play and Luke Dubois and everybody else as we break down goals. So follow me. Let's go break down all the goals and moments of the game. This was a really good one by the Jets. All right, goal number one, nothing special. Nathan Beaulieu absolutely lets a rocket go from the point. It's way too high. This guy's pure dust. I can't believe his first round draft pick. Ends up hitting Stasny up high. Good thing he didn't lose any more teeth. Puck drops down and luckily trickles into the back of the net. Now, what makes this goal special is the fact that Paul Stasny is willing to take in and take this one without blinking. Standing in front of the net's way harder than it seems if you've never done it with a half visor because at any point in time, you could lose a lot of chiclets. So Stasny sticks in there, takes it, gets a beautiful goal. But Bolu, that's not the shot. It worked out though. And trust me, when these guys got to the bench, Stasny gave him a tap and said, don't worry about it. We got the goal. And Bull you said, oh, oh, my bad, buddy. My bad. Uh, that's 100% the way the conversation went down. All right, goal number two. I love talking about face-offs. So the Jets face-off here, you basically have your D-man here and your D-man here, two wingers here. The roles of the face-off are very simple. Adam Lowry needs to tie up his centerman, so you need to have a tie-up here. Then you got to have your first winger busting out to the high point, your second winger busting out to the high point in that order. So left side guy goes to left D, right side guy goes to right D, and you stack them both in the middle because you want to block shots. So that's the reason you don't go ahead and put a winger over here on the wall. Now, what else is cool about this draw is that you have Neil Pionk over here tied up on the wall. Sometimes you'll see an empty wall here, and what you'll actually end up seeing is a D back here, and we'll push this D man up here. So you have three guys lined up on the far side, and you have one D man down here, and nobody at the hash. I absolutely despise that setup because it is just... Just way too easy to slap the puck if you're the offensive team to the free wall. It's just, it's a free face-off win when guys line up that way. So I like most of this setup with the exception of, I think the D-man has to push up and be in the middle here. I still like to have my one, two, and three players along the wall here. And what happens when that draw is one, Neil Pionk makes a little bit of a move thinking, you know, there was, it was a bit of a cheat. And that move allows Dallas to cut inside. And as soon as Dallas ends up cutting inside, you have Brendan Dillon cheating to the corner. And as soon as Brendan Dillon cheats the corner, you have two defensemen on the wrong side. I'll show you what I mean. There's that little cheat. You can see it right there. So the Jets actually win the draw and the puck is down here. And you can see because of that little stutter step, Neil Pionk loses the race to the puck. So Dylan ends up pushing in, but that allows Jamie Ben to sneak to the slot. And the Jets have one more opportunity down here where they collect the puck. But you can see the X factor here. Jamie Ben has just snuck in. And that is because of those two wingers both push to the point like they should have, that was by design. And you have both defensemen down low and trapped. And unfortunately, you got one, two, three Jets versus one. They shouldn't lose this. They do. And the puck ends up squirting out to Ben. This all happens simply because I don't like the faceoff setup. At the end of the day, that's a coach's area. I don't think this is a great setup. They got scored on. But here's the Jets power play that I absolutely adore. Josh Morrissey ends up potting this one from the shooter position. So for those of you who don't know, you've got your top or your quarterback man who is Nate Schmidt. You got your shooter one, which is Josh Morrissey. You got your shooter two, which is Mark Shifley. And on the left side, you want a righty. And on the right side, you want a lefty. You want to switch the wings. You have Pierre-Luc Dubois as your slot man. And you have Blake Wheeler as what you'd call your puck hound. Wheeler Wheeler's got a really important job on this power play. Wheeler's job is to get all loose pucks and be an outlet at the same time. So he actually has to cover the entire length of the ice below the circles, as well as call in Pierre-Luc Dubois when he's outmanned. He has to be an outlet pass, which is what he's doing right now with Mark Shifley. And he has to be present in the back door to score. So it's a very complex position and it's a great position for Blake Wheeler. What's also really nice about this power play is you have two righties. So when you have two righties on the same side and then you have three lefties, what that means is if you can't get set up and Mark Shifley finds himself anywhere else in the power play, and that can happen from time to time, Blake Wheeler can take his spot on the shooter wall. And the same thing happens if Josh Morrissey loses his spot. So I Ideally, you want Morrissey and Shifley in the spots they're in right now, but if they get lost, at least you have balance on the lines to be able to help out with that. And the other thing you're going to see here on the power play is this is called
called a 1-3-1. It's because you have one up top, you have three guys down straight line here, and you have one on the bottom. Dallas is in perfect position, and what Mark Shifley is looking to do is get that puck cross ice over to Morrissey. So he can do that a few ways. He can get the puck up here to the wall to Nate Schmidt, and what Nate Schmidt should do is bounce to the wall in order to make that open. Or he can come down low here to Blake Wheeler as well. Or he can even force this into Pierre-Luc Dubois, which isn't a bad option either. So there's a lot of options from a 1-3-1. One, one. And having an intelligent player like Shifley or Morrissey in those shooter positions to help make that decision is very key. So Mark Shifley uses his primary option, which is actually down to Blake Wheeler. And you can see it. I mean, it was the easiest pass to make. Don't get cute. You go up the wall to Schmidt, maybe it gets intercepted. You went down to Wheeler, no problem. And by going down to Wheeler, what happens is that all the Dallas Stars have to collapse in and around the net because Wheeler's close to the net. What that does is it opens up that big, long lane that you'll see right here in order to get the puck to Nate Schmidt. Schmidt so he can move it over to Morrissey, which is going to be our primary action on any power play. And a power play has just got two primary actions, guys. It's not that difficult. You're trying to go from the left side of the ice to the right side of the ice as quick as you can with a one-timer or vice versa. The second option you're looking for is a shot from the top where Nate Schmidt stands or the quarterback position, crash the net, put it in. So those are your two primary weapons on a power play that you're looking to try to accomplish in order to score goals. You can see here that puck traveled all the way up to Nate Schmidt. It's in the middle of making its way to Josh Morrissey, who is a big threat to score on any power play. And I want to spend a lot of time on the Jets power play in today's video because this is an absolutely crucial piece to any offense in the NHL. And I think the Jets absolutely have it right with this setup and power play one and power play two of who they have. Normally on power plays, you're looking for these big booming shots, guys like Ovechkin or Liney or Matthews in the shooter position. But Josh Morrissey is sneaky. And what makes Morrissey such a sneaky ad is he's got an accurate shot. It's not the hardest in the NHL, but he's got a very good one-timer. Mark Shifley, also super underrated shooter. He just doesn't get enough credit for what he does offensively with his hands, with his passing and his shooting. He's an absolutely elite player. We'll get to more of Mark in a minute. Other thing that makes this drive is the fact that they use two defensemen. Pop quiz. What teams use two defensemen in the NHL? There's only three. The Winnipeg Jets, the Arizona Coyotes, and the Vegas Golden Knights. Even the Colorado Avalanche and the Tampa Bay Lightning, who are stacked at D, use one defenseman on each power play. The reason for this is, is teams want to create offense and they believe putting four forwards out are going to create offense. I personally believe two things as a coach. One, eight forwards are not better than your top four defensemen. Your top four defensemen log at least 20 to 25 minutes a game each. They touch the puck a lot. They're confident with the puck and they are the best likely on your team at one timers and moving pucks along the blue line and making passes. That is the skill set of a defenseman. So I love, love, I've always loved having two defensemen on the power play instead of the one and the four forward. The other thing that it does is that if there's a turnover, defensemen are always thinking defensively. So when Josh Morrissey or Nate Schmidt see that there's a potential for a puck to leave their zone, they're automatically backing up because it's what they're programmed to do, and it's going to limit shorthanded opportunities against this unit. So I think it is an absolutely correct play to leave Ehlers and Connor on power play two with Neil Pionk and run the 4-1 over there and then leave Schmidt and Morrissey on power play one. I think it's the absolute correct move to have Blake Wheeler down low. He is the setup guy and one of the best passers in the NHL. Think whatever you want about Wheeler. It's fine. Wheeler can move a puck. He's hyper intelligent and having Luke Dubois in the middle. That's a no brainer. If you didn't see that one coming, I mean. You're just not watching hockey. So I love power play one and power play two is just as vicious because you've got to give a lot of credit to guys like Pionk, Ehlers, and Connor when they're on that unit. Kopp and Stasny, so-so, to be honest. They're serviceable. I like them better than the option, which is Brendan Dillon, Dylan DeMello, or Logan Stanley at that point. So I do agree with the 1-4 at that point, looking at what's left on the Jets' defensive core. But Schmidt and Morrissey, beautiful. Paul's getting it right. All right, and here's an example. Power play one as well. Nate Schmidt moves that puck over to Mark Shifley into the shooter one position, exactly where we want the puck. Shifley takes two strides in, shoots a nice low shot, and everybody crashes and bangs like hell. That is an absolute strategy on a power play. It's the second best strategy on a power play from getting those cross ice passes, but it's a viable strategy. We all know what happens next. Luke Dubois kicks in on the rebound, pushes the puck in with his skate. No kicking motion goes flying through the air after getting tripped. Goal Jets. And Luke Dubois continues his streak of scoring without a stick 
crashing and banging and being the best Winnipeg Jet on the ice. This guy is an absolute monster of a power forward. Don't care how pretty they are. Dubois is as effective as they come this year. He's playing himself into a contract long term with a seven. Heck, maybe an eight. This guy's a beauty right now. And then as discussed at the beginning of the video, we see the Jets take an untimely penalty and just like, Oh, you could feel it. You got a backup goalie in net. You take a bad penalty at that point in time. Now you got to send your penalty kill out there to kill it. The Jets penalty kill is just not that good under Paul Maurice. I don't believe it ever will be. They just spread out way too much. They leave Comrie out to dry. Comrie battles like crazy, but the puck ends up going in a greasy goal from the Dallas Stars. Really, really nice job here, though. I'm going to show you what I mean on this goal. This is what I would change for the Jets penalty kill. Let's just take a quick look here. So the Jets are running your standard. They they used to call this a box, right? Because, I mean, if you drew it, it looks like, you know, it resembles a bit of a box. That doesn't exist anymore. That's your dad's hockey. So what we have right here, we call this the T intersection. It's right at the top of the circle in the middle of the slot. And you basically want to have somebody in this position at all times then to push out. And then you have another person pushing into the T intersection. And what that does is, is that allows you to cover two guys at the top, two guys at the bottom in a mix of a box and a diamond and a couple other fun shapes people want to talk about but, but penalty kills are just not that simple anymore there's just different tactics on it and it is a very high iq thing to have to work on what we've seen the montreal canadians do not this year don't don't take them this year but last year in their cup run and i really like this i've never seen it done before is they actually play three down low and one up top meaning they're basically stacking the bottom near the goalie with three players and they're allowing one player to cover three up top. So they're saying, hey, our goalie is good enough in Carey Price that you can take shots from the top all day. He's likely going to stop and we're not going to allow greasy rebounds or cross ice passes to beat us down low. I think this is what the Jets should be doing. You know, and why do I say that? Because what you can see is that you got one, two, three Dallas Stars against two Winnipeg Jets down low. That's not where you want to be. You don't want to be outnumbered in front of your goalie, but they are right now. And that is a bit of a problem. And that's why this puck ends up getting banged in. You're always going to lose when you're outnumbered. I mean, I know you can win outnumbered, but it's just, it's not the strategy in hockey. The strategy in hockey is that you want to go ahead and you want to outnumber your opponents at all times, even if you're short. Now that may sound weird to some of you, but you can outnumber and you can cut the ice off in certain directions that anytime the opposing team has the puck, you can make sure you have two checkers to their one or three to their two. And on penalty kills these days, hell, you'll send four on their four. And if they can get it through eight players to get to the ninth guy open, congratulations. You're one on one on oh with the goalie. I mean, that's the theory to penalty kills now. That's why they're so aggressive. So putting three down low makes a ton of sense. And it's a very new concept. It has not been seen. I haven't seen it anyway. Outside of the Montreal Canadiens in their cup run. I really like the idea. I'd be stealing that if I was Maurice. The tying goal from Dallas is exactly what I'd expect with Eric Comrie. Eric Comrie's got two challenges that he needs to overcome being five foot 10 to six feet tall. He leaves a lot of room up top above his shoulders. The position goalies play, you need to be 6'2 to 6'6 six, six at this today's NHL in order to be an effective goalie based on the way angles are played. You're just not going to change my mind on that. Comrie coming in as an undersized goalie really lets a lot of the top net open. There's just too much twine to shoot at and Klingberg ends up taking advantage of that. The other difficulty for being short is cross ice passes are making the move laterally because they're just six inches too short compared to those other goalies at moving in six inches can mean a large difference between how much net is open and making a last minute desperation save so it's just a matter of angles the bigger you are the more you can take it away and yes you can absolutely change that by coming out further and changing the angles in that sense as a goalie but then all you're doing is exposing yourself for a backdoor pass so it's really a no-win scenario for a guy like Comrie he has to work not twice as hard three times as hard but probably 15 to 20 times as hard as a guy like Connor Hellebuck or Andre Vasilevsky at stopping pucks because he gives up six inches to those guys. It is an absolute difficult scenario and a true testament to how good Eric Comrie is as a goalie because you can't control your height. To make the NHL at 5'11", that's incredible. And if you think he's six feet because that's what his profile is listed at, it's an absolute lie. The NHL, NFL, all of it, they all bump it up just a little bit. I've stood beside Comrie. I'm 5'10". Comrie's 5'10", 5'11", at best, 6 feet, 
is just being generous to the man. And here you can see my point. Here's the Klingberg goal. There's just, I know it's a screen, but there's so much net available. Like look behind the jets here. That's a lot of twine available. And that's because he has to back up into his net. When it's a screen, you want to get out to the top of your crease, but you can see he can't get out because the Dallas Stars player and the Winnipeg Jets player is in his way. So that means he has to play back into his crease, which exposes even more twine and doesn't allow him to play the angle that needs to be played. So yes, Harkin's ankle absolutely get broken here by Klingberg, but it's really tough being short in the NHL. All right, so overtime, I'm sitting there thinking the only way we're getting through this is basically limiting it to no shots, and the Winnipeg Jets do that super successfully. I loved it. They kept control of the puck the whole time, and they didn't make any stupid plays with the puck to lose possession because they didn't want to give up an odd man rush on Comrie. They played beautifully in overtime, and every time Kyle Connor or anybody else missed the net with a shot, oh my God, did they hustle to lose pucks. So really good job on Winnipeg in that overtime. Going into a shootout, it was funny because the only thing I'm thinking at this point is NHL players... Hockey players love to get cute in shootouts. They look for the five hole. They look for different things because when you're playing against goalies as big as they are in the NHL, things like the five hole and the cute little plays you see on shootouts, they work. You have to find a way to move a big man. Comrie is a small man. You want to score on Comrie? Two really easy ways. Skate really fast in a straight line and roof it over his shoulder. You're going to push him back into his net and you're going to take away that angle and you're just going to lay it up into all that daylight. Number two is to go on a really, really wide angle because again, I said it, he's short. He can't make those post-to-post -post kick saves like every other goalie can in the NHL. So you're going to go ahead and score. That's all you got to do on it. First shot that they take, they shoot five hole, Dallas does. Comrie, big save. Dumb move, you got cute. Same with shot number three. They get cute, they go slow into Comrie instead of fast. If he would have just sped up and gone 100 miles an hour and roofed it, he would have scored. So yes, he shoots it over the net, but he went too slow. Joe Pavelski here shows us exactly how it's done. He takes an uber wide angle, stretches Comrie out and puts it in. I don't know if they weren't listening to Joe or whatever it was, but Joe knew how to score on this one. Veteran play. I mean, first off, look at this absolutely wide angle that Joe takes. He actually comes outside of the circle, which is beautiful. And what he's done is he's pushed Comrie outside his crease, which is exactly what Comrie's got to do. But now he's going to walk him all the way around. And that is so much room. That is absolutely so much room for a goalie to cover. It's nearly impossible when you're 6'5". So he crosses what we call that Royal Road, which is an invisible road in the middle. And when you cross that Royal Road, you have the best chance in the NHL statistically of scoring. It just gets exponentially higher when you're playing against a guy under six feet. Now, from this position, you can see Comrie is anticipating shot. He's hoping he goes five hole here because Comrie has him. Pavelski doesn't do it. He walks it wide. And that's all she wrote. Goal. And you can see it beautifully here on this angle. I talked about six inches. That's about six to eight inches right there. I mean... If he just has that little bit of extra thing, he can stop it. And he is fully stretched out. You can see that. This is not Comrie's fault. This is just the way you got to win hockey games. He does it Shell 95 style. East to West puts it in. But speaking of absolutely sick shootout goals, let's go ahead. Let's run Kyle Connors. I mean, this is just dirty. How many moves does one guy get to make on a shootout? He is the magic man. He's amazing. And then finally, Mark Shifley shows up. And again, guys just rag on Shifley over and over. And I don't get why. He's not making 11 million bucks like Mitch Marner. He's a six and a half million dollar player playing like an 11 million dollar player with some of the best hands and shot in the NHL. He just reminds us there of why he is Mark Shifley. You're getting a deal on him. You're getting a number one center. You're getting a goal scorer. You're getting a passer. The guy's amazing. What a nice goal by Shifley. All right, team. So that about does it. The Jets play fantastic. Eric Comrie does his absolute best. They steal a game with Comrie. Hella buck. Big thumbs up. Congratulations there. Papa Heli. You got a young one coming into it. The Jets do it for Heli. They do it for Comrie. There's line balance. The Jets power play looks excellent. All in all, this is a very, very good game of hockey. So congratulations to Winnipeg Jets.